This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Okay, we're back. We're live. We're here at the 4 o'clock block on a given Monday. And we are, of course, talking about Think Tech in Asia with Russell Liu, who joins us by Skype from Beijing. He's in a coffee shop there. It's an international coffee shop. And today we're going to talk about the lessons which can and must be learned from China's latest revolution. That's the innovation revolution, Chinese style. It's real. Copycatting is out. Innovation is in. Chinese companies such as the bike sharing company, we talked about that a few weeks ago, OFO, OFO, is going global. It's already in Europe and has started operations in Seattle in the U.S. Success and innovation can be attributed to technology, mostly information technology, motivated unicorns, Russell will tell us what that is, and billionaires who have the attitudes of the everyday Chinese consumers in mind. So how does China's innovation and its unicorns impact Americans? So for Americans, it's a time to rethink our traditional business platforms, consider new platforms, doing business which are technologically based and which focus on becoming global. This time, we got to imitate them. What do you think, Russell? Welcome to the show. I think it's... I think it's it's something that is exciting. Um, it's something that not many Americans see this. Um, it's something you don't hear much in the U.S. news. But the Chinese are forging ahead. It's, it's a revolution. Uh, no longer it's a copycat culture. That was that's out. That's not in. The big thing these days is that there's a new generation of entrepreneurs who are staking their futures on the internet. Uh, and um, and also on technology. Well, here we are, uh, and the uh, People's Congress, the National Congress, is meeting right now. Xi Jinping is about to give uh, his, his, his policy speech to the Congress. That's always an important moment, and, and historically, uh, these speeches have signaled uh, new directions for China, <clears throat> new initiatives. So any ideas about what he might discuss? And is it possible, Russell, that he will discuss this very idea, this idea of innovation for China? Well, well I think it's important to realize that um, uh, the way that the, the Chinese uh, uh, change their policy, they have a, a Congress and Xi Jinping. And, you know, it's to the credit. They actually um, have been actually progressive and really forward thinking. Now, it's not only Xi Jinping, it's years ago when China first said, we're going to make English a core language requirement and start in the first grade. So mm -hmm. everybody learns English, just like math uh, and science. Mm -hmm. So that has is itself started this innovation revolution years ago. And I think it's something Americans have not seen. Now, former President Barack Obama said we should have a second language. To start to, to, and that's really because it's, it gives a culture of being global. It expands our vision. You know, it's not just the U.S. And and so that's why these new models from China are really based on what was started 40 years ago when the government said we're going to have English as a core language. So to their credit, um, and WTO all changed it, and it's amazing because that's why China jumped ahead of Japan to take the number two spot because English is a language of business. And English allows the Chinese access to the internet. So the information they see like Americans. So they can process this and all of this combined to help make this new revolution, this innovation revolution. And the China government saw it a few years ago when they have every five years, they have a 12 year, every few years of a, of a several year plan I hear for the country. And they did say, we're gonna change it to innovation. We're gonna change society to innovation. So they've allowed innovation to happen. Yeah. <clears throat> well, this so is I'm part of to see something. It's part of Hu Jintao's initiative to uh, to create things for the for the benefit of the Chinese consumer, um, and I think this is part of that. This is this is the Chinese consumer. In order to do an innovation revolution, as you describe, you have to have at least well, you have to have three sides to it. One is that you have to have a tech industry who's been well-trained and smart and creative and uh, well-capitalized 
in, in order to create the technology to be innovative and to be innovative on, on a level that will reach the whole country. Secondly, um, you got to have the government backing it up. And in China, well, clearly the government backs it up. I think the government may have initiated it in many ways. <clears throat> and thirdly, you got to have a public, a public who is sophisticated, who's, uh, who understands about technology, who understands about consuming technology, who's not afraid of it. <clears throat> They're not running away from yeah. it. They, they, they relish it. They want to use it. They want to embrace it. And all these three things are happening now. So it's a confluence of factors and events that is giving China a tremendous boost, at least in information technology, changing the lives of its 1.4 million people. Uh, and you see that all the time. You talk about it all the time. And I'm, I'm convinced that it exists not only in the big cities like Beijing and Shanghai, but in, in the second tier cities and the cities in the West, and for that matter, in, in, in smaller cities yet. Uh, in China, and it's sweeping the country. I mean, am I right about that? It's sweeping the country. It, it, the whole country is in the revolution. And when you think about it, with 730 million smartphone internet users, it means second tier cities, the people in Xinjiang province, the people in Chengdu, they get a chance to see what's going on in the world, buy products, and also the government has done a Fantastic job of, of 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 building capacity, the infrastructure, the highways, the freeways, the um, high speed train, the fastest in the world. It's all in China. So they have done that to facilitate it. They've allowed the smartphone and the internet to converge, and along with the physical uh, infrastructure. So it means that the whole country is benefiting from this, not just uh, just one. It's not just the big cities, Jay. Mm. Um, Think, imagine what would happen in America if you gave everybody a chance to see the world and they got on smartphones, whether they're in Toledo, Ohio, or whether they're in Raleigh, North Carolina, or New York, or Boston. Everybody would be on the same page, you see. And people, if they have access to buying things, it, it comes by train in the next day or so, or airplane. So all these things is needed so that the people are buying into technology. Yeah, it's a way of life now. The interesting thing is a lot of the technologies we're talking about, which we'll we'll unpack that into a number of companies in a, in a minute. Um, those technologies are consumer technologies, and they are uh, they are technologies by which people buy things, just like in this country. Um, and I'm so mm -hmm. interested in this one concept we're going to talk about, and that is a lot of these companies are they sound in terms of function. They sound a lot like American companies, and their technology is a lot like the technology in the U.S. However, they're fresh. They started recently. They grew in a, in a logarithmic fashion all within the last few years, and now they, are, they have displaced the American companies in China, and they are actually doing better uh, in many ways in the technology that, of the American companies. So what we have here is an initiative that is working really well that is, um, what do you want to call it, Chinese and Chinese, patriotic Chinese, you know, Stand Up China. And this is kind of the next, uh, the next chapter in Stand Up China. Uh, it's, uh, it's something that's going to take China to new level. It is taking China to new levels. But what I would like to talk with you about, Russell, is the specific companies and how they compare with the American companies. You, you mentioned a moment ago about the cell phones. So who's making the cell phones? Who's supplying the cell phones? And who's building the infrastructure that lets them talk to each other? And for that matter, you know, that carries the internet in China. What's the condition of cell phones and internet transmissions, broadband? Well, you know, it's, 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 a, it's one of the biggest way of uh, change, game changer in China. You know, if you go to Starbucks in the US, you see everybody carry laptops to get on to the internet. In China, they don't need laptops. They go everywhere. They they buy um, Apple phones, iPhones for the for the businessmen, and down to the everyday person, you buy Xiaomi or Huawei. These are affordable smartphones. Now, the way the telephones work in China, smartphones. I don't have a contract where I'm locked in for a year or two years. I I just pay every month. I go and buy credit. I put credit on my cell phone. Okay. And it, 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 it suits how much time I need, how much data 
I need to go over there. It, it suits me. That's all I need to do. But imagine this. When you're not locked into contracts, the contracts are like the old platform mm. where you, you, you're locked into some plan. Okay. Uh, and then what happens is that you have companies that don't push technology. They're not competitive. In China, everything's competitive. The, the mobile companies, China Mobile, uh, China Unicom, they work with these uh, with these companies, you know, uh, like Baidu, the search engine, Alibaba, JD.com. They use the smartphones. Uh, and WeChat uses a smartphone exclusively. It's become a cashless society. We don't carry cash. We just carry a smartphone phone that's linked into the WeChat to our banks, and we make payments instantly, you know. Um, so it's it's a very different society. Well, it sounds, Rus it sounds Russell, that, uh, that what's happened here is the smartphone, I mean, we think we think we have a lock on the smartphone, uh, that we have the Apple, we have, you know, the Android and all that, and we have a lot of apps that came out of the Apple initiative. Um, but in fact, for all the activity that we in the United States and in Europe, for that matter, uh, have on smartphones, it sounds to me like the activity and the personal leverage of the individual citizen all over China on smartphones in China is actually greater now, um, in term, both in terms of holding the money on the, on the phone, being able to achieve purchases on the phone, and sales, and conducting business, and doing all the things that all these companies, all of which operate on that platform, are doing. So what we have here is a kind of a leapfrog. They started out behind us, but now, in terms of smartphones, it sounds to me like they're ahead of us. What do you think? Well, yeah, I think you're, you're exactly the point, Jay. We're, they're just ahead of us. For example, through technology, through the internet, through the smartphones. In China last year, um, they uh, racked up 8.6 trillion US dollars of business using the smartphone over the internet. As compared to US, we're talking $112 billion. You know, what, what does it mean to the everyday citizen? Well, I'll tell you what it means. It means I could be sitting on the subway and ordering something I forgot to order. I want to order maybe some seafood. I have some friends coming tomorrow. I order seafood. It's uh, it's out of Tianjin, and it comes tomorrow. I forgot the cake today. I need a German forest cake, so I will order it from the bakery, and he gets it in two or three hours. It's all delivered to my footsteps, okay? Now, imagine what I have to do in America. I've got to get the old phone, look up the Internet for the phone number, call them up. There's a lot of brick and mortar experience. Expense in that for the for the for the guy that's making the cake, uh, and, and also the fact is that I have to take out my laptop. It becomes a deterrent to business if I have to take out my laptop, open my MacBook, power it up, get on the internet, do the search. My God, I've wasted time. So we've come from a, a society here that's fast moving and it's very efficient. Mm. It's a very different way to organize your life. Mm -hmm. Everything's moving at warp speed. Who's who's making these uh, smartphones that are so ubiquitous in China? Uh, is it is it is it iPhone? Is it Samsung? Or is it someone else? Well, the big driver for the smartphone has actually been companies like Xiaomi and Huawei. They've been producing for a number of years affordable phones. You don't need to get an expensive iPhone, okay? But the key driver really are these internet application companies that create the applications. For example, Tencent created the application called WeChat, okay? Uh, and we have um, things now that are created in China. For example, WeChat and Apple iPhone, Apple had, a, had, a, had an issue because through WeChat, they would have a tipping box where people, when they see a video, can tip to that person, make a tip. Mm. So a lot of millionaires are created through that mm. uh, platform. Mm -hmm. uh, WeChat didn't make any money, but it, so it, it, it's a captive audience. It's been a big, it's building a big fan base, and now Apple has introduced something like that to, I believe, iMessage, where you can tip off your uh, or pay your babysitter or a friend. So we're seeing a lot of Americans copying now the Chinese <laughs> some of these applications. We, we're we're seeing just the reverse. <laughs> but again, uh, Jay, it's 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 exciting because uh, I'm out on the street. I need a taxi. I don't use my phone. Uh, Uber is not is, is not in China. Didi Chuxing is, and with that uh, application, I can get a taxi. I can get a car. I can get a bus. Whatever I need to get, I can I can hail that. 
very easily. And believe it or not, when I when I call a taxi through this application, I see on my smartphone where that car is. For example, you will see the map and you'll see where it's coming from, and it will give you a time estimate. All this is in technology, Jay. That's, that's um, remarkable, so, but you know uh, what? It's making a society. What re really appeals to me, Russell, is this notion about the tip thing. And uh, if, if you're interested in um, you know, tipping think, think tank, that would be, think tech, that would be good. Um, because uh, uh, this kind of technology would be useful in, in this country. A lot of people like to tip, and if anybody wants to tip us, we're, we're happy to take the tip. Uh, in the meantime, we're going to give a minute to think about that, maybe receive some tips. And uh, then we're going to come back and we're going to talk about uh, we're going to talk about all the other companies you mentioned because they all run a parallel. There's a there's a there's a fundamental you know uh, baseline thing happening here, and it involves the displacement of the American technology in favor of the Chinese technology and the Chinese companies. And I think if, the more we explore these companies, the more we're going to confirm you know that that um, that that proposition. So uh, give us a minute, Russell. Uh, send your tip, and we'll be right back in one minute with Russell Liu. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. I just walked by and I said, what's happening, guys? They told me they were making music. Hi, I'm Pete McGuinness-Mark, and every Monday at 1 o'clock, I present Think Tech Hawaii's Research in Manoa, where we bring together researchers from across the campus to describe a whole series of scientifically interesting topics of interest both to Hawaii and around the world. So hopefully you can join me 1 o'clock Monday afternoon for Think Tech Hawaii's Research in Manoa. Okay, we're back. We're more excited than ever in talking with Russell Liu, who's a Hawaii lawyer who practices and teaches in a law school in, in Beijing, in China. And he's our observer, our man on the street there. And he, he's got some fantastic stories and sea changes to describe to us. And the sea change we're talking about today is these innovation companies that have sprung up in recent years and done remarkable things to change the lives of of all the people in China in every city. And so, uh, you know, the, the message that I'm get, getting, Russell, is that these Chinese companies have not just imitated, they've gone beyond uh, American companies, and the people have not just warmed up to it, they live by it, and it has changed their society remarkably. I mean, you can put down fast trains and, um, you know, and roads that connect the, the whole country, but uh, the, what what the, imp the impact of, of these technology companies is extraordinary. And so I want to explore some of the others with you. We've talked briefly about Uber, how there's a, an Uber in China that goes beyond. Um, uh, I'd like to talk to you about WeChat. You mentioned that earlier. That's a kind of, it's a, it's a kind of uh, social, uh, it's a, so, a social media kind of uh, program, but it goes way beyond that, isn't it? Um, you were talking about going to a restaurant and using WeChat to um, order your food and to pay for your food without even standing up. How does that work? Um, it's very simple. I could be in the second floor. I was, I was having lunch last week with a fellow American. We're sitting on the second floor of a large restaurant. So we order a dish when we're done. What they do is the waiter or waitress has keyed in the cost of that into our little scanning two code for that table and we simply get our our phone and i turn my weight chat and i'll scan it the code and the, the amount will come on my smartphone and i'll say yes or no pay and i hit pay and then i decide with my friend oh we should be splitting the cost so i get my smartphone and i will say i'll send this how much is it let's divide it and i send that amount what i should pay for my cost to my friend the transaction is done without leaving the table. 
It's without going downstairs to pay the cashier. It's without using the uh, waiter to, 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 to carry on the services. So all of these things affect everyday living in China. Yeah, and now what about the social media aspect of that? Um, WeChat is also a, sort of a social media program, isn't it? Doesn't it do the same kinds of things that American social media companies do? Well, yes, well, WeChat, um, through WeChat, I'm able to, to actually do a video call with somebody. Uh, I'm in the U.S. I don't keep, I'm calling my Chinese friend. I don't use the long distance company. I, when I'm on the internet, I press talk and it will ring the other person in China and they will hit accept or no, decline this, and we can start talking over the phone. I do a lot of calls like that. So uh, many Americans who come to China now all have WeChat. You can, you can use WeChat in the U.S. from one U.S. user to another. So that's why the applicability of WeChat, some of these social platforms, are gaining global uh, attention because you can use WeChat in the U.S. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to use it only in China. So it's a great way to also, I teach a law class. Uh, I want to send my PowerPoint to the students. I will put the PowerPoint on my smartphone and I send it to WeChat. And, and that is faster than using uh, email. It's faster than using email. How, how would you compare? I, I instant response. How would you compare WeChat with uh, something like uh, like Twitter uh, or uh, Facebook? I mean, is it, does it does it fill that gap too? Well, Jay, with Facebook, I have to log onto a computer. I basically have to open a computer. That's the biggest deterrent. I don't want to carry my computer. I want I want to be able to be connected wherever I go. So WeChat uses the smartphone. Mm -hmm. Okay, I well, I'm connected wherever I'm going. It's quite remarkable what's happening. And uh, let's talk about Alibaba for a minute. That's the Jack Ma company, huge company in only a few years. It's it's displaced uh, any kind of uh, Amazon type company in in uh, China. They're they're selling everything and delivering it everywhere. Can you talk about how big and ubiquitous that is? And you, can you talk about whether Amazon or any other competitor might exist in China to do the same thing that Alibaba's doing? Well, I, I think I think there are different hurdles here because number one, I think I think the American companies don't understand the culture. They don't understand how things are done here in China. You know, um, I think to become a mega giant, if I was Jeff Bezos of Amazon, I would set up a logistics center maybe in Honolulu. And I would work with Alibaba, the joint venture, and the U.S. products. You can buy Amazon things out of China. And when you click on Amazon, it'll say, ship to China. Yes, we ship to China. <laughs> really? My idea is, if, if, hey, listen to the governor. Now, governor, I hope you're listening, is to open up um, special zones in Hawaii and Honolulu to facilitate logistics mm -hmm. and be able to uh, work with the Chinese companies Give them a favorable tax rate. Let them come in here and make an investment. And you will create, all of a sudden, Honolulu, a, a super, super value place up to value chain. Okay? Well, um, you know, so, Jeff you know, Bezos was talks. here a few weeks ago. That's what I understand. So maybe this is in the cards in some way. Certainly, Hawaii would be a great place for his mega center, especially if he's thinking of, uh, you know, being a sort of a a commercial or merchandise bridge with Asia, going both ways. Uh, Hawaii could play a great role in that way. So, Russell, I'm sorry, Jay. How, how does how does the uh, Alibaba, you know, compare in, in terms of its, you know, its uh, uh, its involvement in the daily life of a Chinese person with Amazon? Amazon's getting to be the source of all retail products, really, for a lot of people I know and for my family. Um, we get so much from Amazon. Is that the way it happens with Alibaba also? Well, I think Alibaba is more than just what Amazon is. You know, I, I understand you can buy food, you can buy things like that. I think Amazon's heading that direction uh, of being able to, to deliver things like that. But we're seeing a little copying of the, of the, of the Chinese platform. Um, I think it's more pervasive in everyday lives. Mm -hmm. But the key thing really is to technology, Jay, the accessibility through the smartphone, the application, mm -hmm. and the internet. So you mm -hmm. need several partners. You need the government to be have a policy of innovation. 
-hmm. you need uh, you need technology companies like Alibaba. Okay, it's tied into the uh, distribution chain and the companies. Then uh, you need people who buy into this thing, yes, who buy into technology. Yes. People who uh, move through their smartphones. So you need all of this together. Well, let's um, talk about so what I wanted to talk about was the people factor, which we haven't talked. Yes. Well, I, and that would take me to, uh, you know, the, the granddaddy of them all, uh, the empire, so to speak, of uh, Google. Google, who can do so much and does do so much to change our world on the Internet. But, but Google, I don't know if Google exists in China, but you certainly have Baidu. And the American people and people I know have made a lot of money in investing in Baidu stock um, because it's growing so fast. Um, so how does Baidu in China compare with Google, either in China or the U.S.? Yes, Baidu is, is the big search engine here in China. Um, and I think um, through Baidu, it has uh, uh, been able to be an effective way for many Chinese to connect to the Internet. Um, I, I, think, I think, you know, uh, one of the things that uh, I'm, I'm cognizant of is that you know, it's a different culture here. It's a different um, regulations here. So um, I think Google, uh, for it to compete, um, there are certain regulatory requirements here. Um, same way if a Chinese company went to the U.S., they would have to follow U.S. regulatory mm -hmm. requirements. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think that um, we are seeing more American companies having to adapt and change so that they could be in this market here. It is a huge market. Um, and it's getting bigger and bigger. Um, and again, it's changing uh, the way people do things. I think the internet is, is a common thing. Uh, everybody has to have internet here. Uh, it, it, it's, 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 um, it's amazing because uh, through this technology and innovation, um, it holds up the economy. People are spending money every minute, as every second they're on their smartphone yeah. buying things. And, yeah. and, Merchants like Baidu are great helps. It helps that out. Yeah, I'm sure. And and on top of that, the, the regular Google search function for anything and everything you ever wanted to know about anything. But let me let me ask you one more question because we're almost out of time, Russell, and that is this. Uh, so China has some very good software, it's, and it's developing the software. It's, it's kind of in, in, an, in, a, in, a, in a in development cycle on all these products we've talked about to make them better and better, and people feed back and they use it, and so you have this huge market with great, the stakes are very high to try to improve it, you know, and improve it again and again and again, so that it's uh, per pervasive. Um, so the question is, is, and you mentioned, by the way, uh, that WeChat, known as WeChat in the U.S., is now in the U.S., and I think uh, you talked about uh, other companies that are in the U.S., Chinese companies that have started doing business in the U.S., these very companies we're talking about, companies that emulated American companies are now back in America, competing with the same American companies they emulated and surpassed. What about other parts of the world? Um, do you see the possibility of this intellectual property, um, of these uh, you know, tech companies, information tech companies being exported, you know, sh setting up shop? Um, you know, getting, getting, getting some traction in Southeast Asia, in Australia, New Zealand, India. Uh, is, that, is that likely to happen or is it going to stay in China? Well, Jay, um, I'm sorry, I might have missed the last part of your question, but I think the gist of it is that um, I, I've, I've seen the Chinese companies have gone abroad already. Um, for example, in Central South America, you fly into the airport, I see banners of Huawei. They're all over China. Chinese companies are there. Um, one of the driving forces is that China has come up with this One Belt, One Road um, program. Um, it is happening. People from different parts of the world are coming here um, to figure the business angle of how they're going to play the game. And in doing so, um, they've taken many of the Chinese things, the products and so forth. Uh, uh, back to their home country. Um, so uh, I think that the key common thing in the culture is economics. Uh, if, if there's a way for people to make money, they will find a way and they will adapt that technology, especially considering around the world, most countries are not as developed as the U.S. 
So therefore, in developing countries, they see China, uh, they saw how it has risen. They see the use of technology for people. Even poor people have the technology. They all have cell phones. So they see that the Chinese have the application for it. Not the Americans, the Chinese. So they're going to start to slowly shift over to using the Chinese platforms. And so that's why Chinese products, Chinese technology uh, are, are all going to be pervasive. It's, um, so that's where I see uh, the U.S. kind of losing the edge because we make products for only a U.S. market. We make products to fit the old platforms, the AT&Ts, the T-Mobiles. We don't use it to fit how to merge these things in the smartphone. Yeah. You know, maybe Apple is, a, is, is, is probably the only one that's kind of ahead, but I think everyone else in the U.S. is on the old traditional base models. Those models are too expensive to take to a third world country. Yeah, well, things are happening. This is a tremendous sea change. And uh, if we haven't mentioned it specifically, and you started out this program with the same thought, is that, you know, yes, you can put Mandarin on a cell phone, but you can also put English on a cell phone. And I can be here in Honolulu and download WeChat in English. So all these programs we've talked about can be written in English. They are being written in English. They are exportable, not only this country, but everywhere. So we've really uh, we've touched on a very important subject, Russell. Thank you so much for joining us and helping us understand. Uh, we want to come back and discuss more, more of these companies, more of this technology. It's a moving target, and you can help us with that. Russell Liu, a Hawaii attorney practicing and teaching in Beijing. Thank you so much, Russell.